So it's quite difficult to really tell where the word neurodegeneration came from. It's now an accepted concept, but I think as in all areas of science, it's very important to remember this is a word that has been coined and we need to be very cautious uh, before we think we've understood something just by naming it. And so ne what we mean by neurodegeneration is that the nervous system uh, evolves and develops normally in an individual and at some point in their life it begins to fail and it begins to fail in a series of rather characteristic ways. So there are some commonalities between these different neurodegenerative diseases but actually one very important principle is that they are all rather separate entities and that's important from the point of view of trying to understand the biology and also how we might provide therapy for these disorders. Uh, and a lot has been written in the past about the overlaps and about some of the things that might mean there might be one treatment for lots of different forms of age-related degeneration. But actually the more we learn, the more we realise that these are complex diseases with their own particular biology. So the chief neurodegenerative diseases, uh, and in terms of, of the way they affect society, Alzheimer's disease is clearly the most important. So Alzheimer's disease overwhelmingly is the public health problem that we need to try and solve. And um, Alzheimer's disease was characterised in the late 19th century by pathologists, by people looking down microscopes saying, well, here's somebody in life who has a failing nervous system. What do we see in the brain? And what characteristically was observed is a particular way in which proteins are accumulating in the brain in Alzheimer's so-called amyloid plaques and tau tangles. And in other diseases like Parkinson's, there are particular forms of protein hallmark. In, in Parkinson's, it's called the Levy body, and in ALS, it's called the ubiquitinated inclusion. So yes, in common, there is the observation that protein is accumulating in these cells, but these are different proteins, and actually, we don't know whether it's the accumulation of the protein, which is, is an injury phenomenon, or that's a protective response, or it's simply an epiphenomenon. So uh, neurogenerative diseases have the clear common feature that they are age dependent and uh, you know we don't see these disorders really in infants or children except in very specific genetic disorders where the brain certainly degenerates but again in rather different ways to the way in which it does in aging. So an important question which often gets discussed is whether normal aging and neurogeneration are in fact the same thing. That's a very complex topic. I mean again Aging, what do we mean by aging? We simply mean the passage of time and, and, and things getting older. Uh, is there a process called aging? So at the cellular level, there is a concept of cellular senescence, where a number of things happen that prevent the cell after a particular period of years from regenerating. Um, and that's effectively why aging occurs. And the processes which occur in neurogeneration are somewhat different. However, they intersect because despite having a genetic uh, makeup which might you know, promote neurogeneration, either at the single gene level or in a complex way, until you get aging, these other cofactors do not trigger the disease. So we have to understand both of these things and how they intersect, and that we're really at the beginning, I think, of our understanding of that. So the classic degenerative disorders of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS account for most cases, but then there are a whole range of other disorders which we classify under neurogeneration. And when people have sought to try and derive a taxonomy for neurogeneration, they have often put things together. So for example, disorders that look a bit like Parkinson's disease, such as progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, corticobasal degeneration, uh, Lewy body dementia. I mean, these disorders have some features of Parkinson's, or so are called Parkinsonian or Parkinsonism disorders. And yet, under the microscope, while there are some features which are, they have in common, there are clearly some differences. So even though progressive supranuclear palsy gets uh, misdiagnosed as Parkinson's disease, under the microscope it's a tauopathy, so the key protein which is deposited is tau protein, more like Alzheimer's disease. Corticobasal generation is the same. Whereas multiple system atrophy is what's called a synucleinopathy because the protein in Levy bodies in, in Parkinson's is alpha-synuclein. That is also present in multiple system atrophy. So you begin to you know, draw a family tree, if you like, of these diseases based upon the protein that's accumulating. But actually, again, one can be rather misled by that. Um, Parkinson's disease has numerous genetic contributions, which some of which are very well understood. 
uh, disorder like multiple system atrophy, despite being a synucleinopathy, actually there are not really any any convincing examples of familial inheritance or genetic except in very rare situations. So, so we are still struggling, I think, to really understand how we might organise these disorders into a system. And if you just simply do it and you rely on, you know, uh, neuropathology, you get one answer, genetics, another answer, clinical features, another answer. So clearly, uh, what you really have to do is to become rather ultra redu reductionist and really understand a disorder at the more molecular level. So the new technologies such as transcriptomics and proteomics are beginning to redefine diseases into subtypes based more on the biological profile and signals that are present in patient biofluids, for example. However, the great public health problem that is Alzheimer's disease, uh, one of the big challenges here is that the number of actual cases of Alzheimer's disease which are truly genetic due to a single gene mutation are very small indeed. So in fact, ALS is a much more genetic disorder than Alzheimer's disease. But for all of these conditions, really the way into therapy is through understanding the disorder, through modelling it in vitro and in vivo using the genetic forms of disease. That's our, currently our only real way of doing it. Modelling sporadic disease is very challenging. So typically what we do in the laboratory is we take a, a genetic mutation. So let's, for example, uh, choose an example of c 9 or 72 So that is a gene which can cause ALS, it can cause uh, frontotemporal dementia both of which pathologically look rather similar under the microscope with ubiquitinated inclusions, but clinically are slightly different. They can occur in the same family. So there are some overlaps, but they're quite different phenotypes. So we might typically seek to model this disease by using induced pluripotent stem cells to then establish in culture motor neurons or cortical neurons and try to understand the transcriptomic profile, which uh, is triggered by the mutation. But when you have a specific genetic mutation, and c 9 or 72 accounts for um, significant numbers of patients, so, so you know 40% in, in our population of the familial cases of ALS, and up to 10% of all ALS cases are due to mutations in c 9 or 72 So it's a very important target. So the kind of therapeutic approaches that you might apply here include antisense oligonucleotides. So the first clinical trials of antisense oligonucleotides are now in development. The way that c 9 or 72 causes disease is because of an expansion of an intronic region uh, of repetitive uh, DNA, which then gets massively expanded from you know, a handful of repeats of a hexanucleotide into about 1,000 to 1,500 repeats to cause disease. And so antisense oligonucleotides can be used to antagonize the RNA, which is the product of this, and therefore, certainly in the laboratory, you can demonstrate that you can correct the cellular phenotypes. So whether that is going to be possible in, in the intact human nervous system, it, once disease has been triggered, we are going to learn in the next few years. But obviously one of the key uh, therapeutic developments that we are very excited about is the concept of, of, of genome editing. So uh, in my laboratory and many others around the world, we have, we have simply used CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to remove the mutation in c 72 corrected everything in the cells, and that at least establishes the concept, the principle, that if you could apply that to patients, you could actually correct the genetic mutation. Now, the logical consequence of that is that what you'd really like to do is to correct it before the disease begins, because for most degenerative diseases of the nervous system, there's very good evidence that when the patient presents to a clinician, they have already had the disease for a number of years, and that they have used up most of their intrinsic reserves. So Alzheimer's disease, when it's been studied, the familial types, there is already evidence of misfolded protein, the accumulation of beta amyloid 20 years or more before memory becomes disturbed. So that tells you that there is an enormous amount of reserve. So what we'd really like to do is to treat people 20 years before they're likely to develop memory problems. And to do that, you need to be able to detect them, you need to be able to treat them safely so that you actually do not cause any harm and you need to work out how to do it economically since these kind of treatments are invariably very expensive. So there are huge challenges even with the apparently rather simple genetic forms of neurogenerative disease. And then if you consider that most forms are not clearly in a simple way genetic, they are sporadic, where there are multiple different genetic susceptibilities, environmental triggers, intrinsic factors within the, the nervous system, then we really have a huge challenge. And I think uh, to really conclusively 
treat newer generations is a very complex task which is going to involve preventive strategies and it's going to involve corrective strategies, which really raises the question of whether regenerative medicine is possible in these disorders. And uh, around the world, numerous institutes have been established of regenerative neurology. And the concept is obviously to try and reconstitute those nervous connections which have gone in order to restore function. And that is a huge challenge. If you take um, the number of neurons there are in the brain, which is likely to be 20 billion or so, each of those on average has reciprocal connections with maybe thousands of other cells. So the architecture of the brain which allows us to think, allows us to move and feel and do all our normal functions is immensely complicated and arises during embryological development through a, an orderly expression of hundreds of genes which are patterned, signaling molecules, migration of cells and establishing of synaptic connections. And of course we have spent you know, 100 years or more looking down a microscope at these progenaceous inclusions in degenerative diseases and of course the real the real physiology of these disorders, or pathophysiology, is at the synapse, which is very far away from the cell body, difficult to visualize. It's synaptic function which gets lost in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and ALS, and that is what needs to be protected. So, so overall, the challenge here is very huge, but it's a technical challenge, and therefore ultimately will be overcome through uh, improved knowledge, but it, one cannot underestimate it. 